Hello, and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. On today's episode, Von Schill sets out to track down Lazarus, a rogue construct renowned for his hatred of the guild. Lazarus's skills could be invaluable to the Freikorp, if he can be trusted. I hope you enjoy Law of Lazarus. Law of Lazarus. Lazarus Joins the Outcast by Graham Stevenson. It was the dead of night, and the room was full of lights. Not bright, efficient, practical lights that any normal man with means would use to illuminate his home, but tiny, firefly-sized motes of every colour. These lights moved around the lower hall in a seemingly random fashion, zagging here, bobbing over there, and in most cases hovering perfectly still some way off the ground. This was all that Von Schill's eyes told him, yet he felt no alarm or even curiosity, because he knew where he was. Not some ethereal fairy grotto, nor yet a madman's carnival or puppet show. He was in Ampersand. The Guild wanted to find this place badly, just as they did every other location in Malifaux over which they could not exert direct control. Not that there was anything going on in Ampersand that necessarily threatened them directly. It just annoyed the hell out of them that they couldn't find it. Von Schill sucked on the last finger length of his cigar, and added his own little amber light to the conflagration. The room was large, and most of it vanished into inky blackness, and it was full of figures. There were dozens and dozens of them, announced by soft tell-tale glows, the dim shape of a hot solenoid here, a diode there. Ampersand was full of constructs. They came here from all over Malifaux, labour constructs, laboratory mishaps, a whole array of mechanisms that had developed or been imbued with some degree of sentience. Machines, some with just the merest inkling of self-awareness, others as smart as any man on the street, and all of them tired of the abuse, neglect and battery of their former masters. On von Schill's left was a rail golem, sitting on the floor with its huge legs drawn up. Its skull had been crushed near flat by some industrial accident, and it periodically announced its presence by small fits of sparking that lit up the interior of its skull. Huge metal paws designed for shoveling and smashing twitched spastically. He moved further out of reach. He wasn't just here sightseeing, although this place was definitely worth a casual eyeballing if you had the free time. He was looking for a specific construct, and had a strong suspicion this was the place to look. He moved through the near-complete darkness, stepping around clusters of constructs that stood or crouched facing one another, as if frozen in the act of conversing. Many of them looked completely shut down, but here and there a metal head rotated to follow him. Soft muttering could just be detected in some of the nearer clusters, but whatever dialect they were using was unknown to him. A big machine barred his way, it was painted a deep navy blue, the paint chipped away to reveal rusting, blistered steel around the edges of its torso and limbs. It looked like it had seen a lot of heavy use, and most of it was covered in fine scratches. A dozen crimson spider eyes looked down at him, their expression unreadable. Identity unknown, clanked a thick, mechanical voice from somewhere in the chest. Status? Mission. Von Schill gave it the once-over. Instead of hands, it had heavy curved pincers that looked capable of slicing through steel, and it probably tipped the scales at four or five hundred pounds. He decided on the diplomatic approach. I'm here to find someone, he said. I got a job I need them to do. The worker construct seemed to scrutinise him with those tiny, angry eyes. Association, guild, it rumbled. 
The worn steel pincers slid open in anticipation. No. Von Schill shook his head. No guild. Freikorps. The machine seemed almost disappointed. It gave him one last stare and stepped away. The mechanical zoo continued. As he moved deeper into the building, the concentration of shapes increased. He had never suspected there were this many in Malifaux, let alone this many rogue escapees. But then, they were almost a third class of citizen, going about their mind-numbing labours unseen and unheard by the greater populace. Finally, he found what he was looking for, Near the centre of Ampersand was where the most sophisticated and sentient of the renegades congregated. There was a gathering of them around a metal bench under one of the few sources of illumination in the whole place, a glass globe on a thick rubber wire that was suspended from the ceiling some unfathomable distance overhead. The globe threw out a bluish-white illumination that was bright enough to make von Schill squint. Four bulky and inhuman shapes crouched over the bench. Absurdly, impossibly, they were playing cards. Von Schill recognised the construct he was after immediately. His target sat directly ahead, facing him. There was a raw-looking socket at the end of its bulky right arm, like something had been temporarily removed. Von Schill had a good idea what. Instead, a miniature wire clip resembling a band leader's music stand stuck up, holding a fan of five cards. A round green optic in its chest bathed the card faces in emerald light, and a single red eye in the dome head rolled slowly from the cards to its opponents, then back to the cards. The left arm was far more conventional and hovered nearby with the fingers poised. Lazarus, guild hater and anarchist, Dented, scarred, exceptionally capable, and potentially available for hire. Von Schill bided his time, settling against a pillar, which later turned out to be a water tank on legs, and watched. Directly across from Lazarus was a boxy machine with a confusing flurry of arms, each made from thin, interconnecting rods, not much thicker than a marsh reed, Von Schill couldn't quite figure out what it had been designed for, but it sure knew its way around a pack of cards. The arms knifed and jabbed, and those cards flew around the table. To the left of the dealer box was something that looked rather like an upended iron bath with cockroach legs coming out the front. The body was heavily riveted and mighty looking. Thick glass portholes were fitted all around the top, and a single green eye on a stalk moved around inside. There was something nautical looking about it, from the tubing that ran along its underside to the streaks of salt-eaten rust on its flanks and the stink of river mud. It had to be some sort of mechanical diving bell. On the right, and apparently the focus of Lazarus's attention, was a thin and somehow severe-looking machine, it held its cards with double-jointed limbs, and von Schill noticed that the eight fingers attached to each hand were all fitted with rubber tips. It looked to him like a clerical mechanism, an adding machine or some sort of accounting device. The bullet holes in it suggested that it may not have proven as trustworthy as its creator had hoped. They were using washers as chips, and the largest pile by far was beside the adding machine, which seemed appropriate for a game where mathematics was a factor. But, as the constructs played, Von Schill noticed that the tide of the game was steadily turning in Lazarus's favour. That single red eye spent a lot of time fixed on the adding machine, as it shuffled and fussed with its cards. Lazarus seemed to pulse slowly, and then the chips would go down, with Lazarus winning another hand. Von Schill grinned around his cigar. He knew why Lazarus was winning, but it wasn't his place to explain it to the others at the table. Finally, inevitably, the other three machines tapped out, drained at their chips and flat broke. One by one, they clumped and ratcheted away from the table, leaving the victor sitting alone with his mound of oily washers. This looked like as good a time as any, 
and Von Schell slipped into the stool recently vacated by the dealer box. Good game, he said. The red eye rotated around and fixed on him for some seconds, then rolled back to counting its winnings. Von Schill, it grated. Long way from home, Fry Corps. Got a job offer for you. Thought you might like to put that mimic ability of yours to better use than cheating at cards. The eye turned to him again. Cheating. A flesh notion. Flesh law is complex. Illogical semantics. Ethics. Morality. To exist under that yoke is equally illogical. Ego, ampersand. Von Schell chuckled. Dress it up fancy any way you like, Lazarus. It's still cheating. Through flesh eyes, perhaps. Construct law is simpler. I wonder what the diving bell and that walking abacus with the bullet holes in it would say about your interpretation of construct law. Lazarus lifted a massive multi-barreled weapon from under the bench and fixed it to the empty socket of his right arm. A long, glinting bayonet snapped out between them like a spear. Nothing, it grunted. Von Schell eyed the cruel weapon. You're probably right. The construct got to its feet, towering over the still-seated Frycorps leader. State your purpose, Frycorps. Von Schill sucked on his cigar and blew a puff of smoke into the machine's midriff, momentarily clouding the green glow. Oh, I think this will be right up your street. He grinned. Seville Septis wiped his damp palms on his pants. He was a habitually nervous individual and was especially so this evening. He was to make a presentation to the Governor-General himself in the morning, and such opportunities carried an inherent double-edged sword. On the one side, his presentation could go well, and doors would almost certainly open for an aspiring guild lawyer such as himself. On the other, if his intelligence was bad, he would just as certainly be relegated to some unflattering and dead-end duty in a mouldy guild basement for the rest of his professional life. He had done as much as he could to ensure the former result, and the thick sheaf of papers under his arm was the result of months of research and data collation. In short, he was fairly sure that his web of informants had located Ampersand. Not that the place had any great military or tactical value, but he knew that the existence of a haven for rogue constructs that had fled their appointed duty stuck in the Guild General's craw and it was rumoured that the individual who brought about its extinction would curry great favour with the man. It was hard to keep a secret, even within the guild offices, and there were already some circulating rumblings about the content of Seville's briefing. These rumblings had gathered momentum, to the point where he had been assigned a guard unit to make sure that whatever vital crumbs of intelligence he had unearthed were preserved until a proper evaluation could be made. This suited Seville just fine. The streets of Malifaux could not be considered safe even under the midday sun, let alone a late-night journey through a succession of brick lanes to his home. It was a good thing that the guardians were with him. There were four of them, huge, hulking, and metal knights. They formed a square around him, marching in perfect lockstep with their kite shields over an inch thick held against their barrel chests and broadswords clenched in their giant fists. Even one of them would have made a potential ambusher think twice. With four of them at his side day and night, Seville had developed a trace of a swagger in his walk. And there was something else, an ace in the hole that no one knew about but him, a silent shadow that flitted across the rooftops overhead and watched their little procession with baleful amber eyes, Seville had never seen much more than a suggestion of the hunter construct, but he knew it was out there, ranging ahead and scouring the streets and alleys for signs of danger. 
they left Kimudgeon Square and followed Brook Walk for some distance. The crunch of armoured feet on the cobbles echoed, and along with the clanking joints and hissing pistons, it sounded like a lethargic iron wave was rolling slowly through the dark. The guardians were imposing, but far from stealthy. They passed the statue of Long Tom, what the locals called an unremarkable bronze statue that leaned at a bizarre angle as though struck in the legs with a cannonball, its features obscured by green corrosion and passed down Carpenter Row, where the smell of freshly cut and planed weird wood had permeated into the stones. Seville's mind was elsewhere, running obsessively through his presentation once again. The intelligence was good, he was certain of it. Two separate scouts had confirmed the same location after several expensive weeks of searching. The third scout never returned, but Seville knew the old proverb about omelettes and never lost a moment's sleep over it. There were hand-drawn maps and bearings prepared by the scouts. The quarantine zone was legendary for resisting attempts to quantify and map it, almost as if the buildings and streets themselves shifted to foil the guild cartographers. But the information was only weeks old, and Seville was confident Ampersand could be found if they moved quickly. His musings were interrupted by something falling from the black sky above and exploding on the hard cobbles. He almost took it for a chunk of roof tiles, but for the ringing metallic sound it made when it landed. A finger-sized piece of steel and a spring hit him in the chest as he heard similar fragments rattling against the shields of the lead guardians. He peered down at the twisted object lying on the ground for a long time before realisation hit. It was a construct's head. To be more specific, it was a hunter construct's head. His view was instantly blocked by the four guardians raising their shields and clanging together, squeezing the lawyer into a cramped rescue space in the middle. And then the world started to explode around him. Lazarus had waited for the hunter to come within range, turning his baleful red eye upon it and soaking up the inherent agility and stealth of the mechanism. His heavy, crushing feet had become quiet and sure pads. His loud, clanking joints and clunking drive pistons had become as quiet as the breeze that sifted across the chimney pots at his back. The hunter was crouched at the edge of the roof, five stories up and watching the approaching guild lawyer and entourage, rather like a cat watches an unsuspecting mouse. Lazarus had got within feet of it before his presence was finally detected. A single thrust of his bayonet and a hard twist with his left hand, and the machine was decapitated. Lazarus was not surprised at the machine's fragility. The guild was as penny-pinching as it was incompetent, and the hunter was likely cast from recycled frying pans and watch parts. He kicked the sparking body aside and took its place on the roof, watching the guardians and their soft flesh charge moving down Carpenter Row. Even at this distance, he could feel the solidity and durability of the guardians as they approached, their heavy feet stomping down on the cobbles, their shields raised high. Lazarus's eye glowed and his alloys began to change, growing denser and heavier as he started to absorb their essence. Along with their endurance came an understanding of their dogged, single-dimensional programming. Their stoic stand and absorb all was their weakness in this scenario, and Lazarus intended to exploit it to the full. He wanted them in close for his firepower to have the maximum effect, and when they had reached just the right spot, he threw the severed hunter's head out over the edge of the roof and watched it drop onto the cobbles and smash. Instinctively, the guardian snapped into a tight formation with their broad shields raised to all four points of the compass. Perfect. Lazarus raised his right arm and with a hollow punk fired a stubby grenade shell about the size of an apple down into the tight knot of constructs. Seville's teeth rattled in his head as the first explosion hit. 
Although the bulk of the Guardian shielded him from the worst of the blast itself, hot flame engulfed his legs, and the pressure wave felt as though both his ears had been slapped simultaneously. He would have staggered if there had been room. An instant later, there was another explosion, and another. The Guardians were being pounded by some sort of artillery weapon. He could hear shells striking the upraised shields, could feel the impacts travelling through the huge bodies and into his own. He started screaming for the Guardians to back up, to get him off the street, but his words were drowned by the incessant stream of explosions. Shrapnel stung his ankles and calves, his pants were starting to smoulder, and the Guardian to his front and right was rocking backwards, taking the brunt of the blasts. Its shield was already buckled and deformed, and, as Seville watched, another blast drove the shield back into its chest. Something inside broke, and he saw a handful of tiny oil-covered cogs fall from its cracked chest plate. The Guardians were tough, but Seville suspected they couldn't take this punishment for long. He had to find an escape route before they were all smashed to pieces. He turned around in the cramped gap and began to push at the broad back of the guardian that had been protecting his rear, hoping to make a big enough gap to slip out in the confusion. He may as well have tried to push over a house. The shelling continued. He glanced over his shoulder and saw the source, contrails arcing down from the roof across the street. They were being bombarded, and the guardians were reacting to it the only way they knew how by putting themselves and their shields between the attack and their master. Move! He shrieked over the thunder and flames. We need to move! The guardians never responded. The forward construct that had been taking most of the pounding suddenly staggered and fell, spewing oil and broken parts. Its shield had ruptured, and a grenade had hit it full in the chest. The others immediately moved to close the gap, interlocking their shields and bracing their sturdy legs, but they were already battered, and their metal was blackened from the explosions. Finally, though, he saw his chance. With the other two guardians moving forward to form an arrowhead shield wall against the grenade salvo, there was a space to the rear. A building sat less than fifty feet away, and the door looked none too sturdy. A run and a hard shoulder charge, and he would be halfway to freedom. His escape plan came to a jerking halt, however, when one of the guardians grabbed his upper arm and yanked him into its shadow. Stay behind me, it bellowed through the hail of explosions, ignoring his pleas and struggles to be released. Quite suddenly, the barrage of grenades shifted, dropping low, and bouncing under the raised shields of the guardians. Seville recoiled in horror, but could only twist like a leash dog in the guardians' grasp as the yellow blossom of fire engulfed them all. Lazarus stepped off the rooftop, landing on his haunches with a tremendous crunch that fractured the stone, using the hunter's agility to absorb the drop from such a height. The guardians were all down. As he got close, he saw that one was still active, although its legs were twisted ruins. Its implacable face was fixed on him as it dragged itself forward with its remaining arm. Intercept, it grated. Eliminate. Lazarus drove the point of his bayonet through its skull and twisted. The mechanism finally slumped. He had to kick around in the wreckage for a minute to find the lawyer. He was alive and relatively intact, although his face and clothes were burned and torn from the grenade blasts. Trembling convulsively, he stared up at the big construct with terror and self-pity, his mask blasted off. Lazarus pressed the tip of his oil-smeared blade against the shivering lawyer's nose. The dossier, he said. Many of the paper sheets were burned around the edges and one piece of shrapnel had punched a hole clean through the folder, but the lawyer meekly offered up the tattered information nevertheless. Lazarus took it without comment, his gun arm pointed directly at Seville. 
the barrel mouth still glowed faintly. It would be easy to finish off this guild rat. A single thrust would do it. Von Schill had been quite specific about keeping him alive, though. The Freikorps leader seemed to think that there was more information to be had from the lawyer, information that would command a high price from interested parties. Lazarus cared nothing for such intelligence. His only motivation in taking this mission had been protecting the anonymity of Ampersand. Besides, he hated the guild and everything it touched. He needed only to kill this rat, and then the scouts indicted in the dossier and Ampersand would once again be beyond the guild's reach. Von Schill had been insistent, but Lazarus was not governed by his flesh law. He raised his bayonet arm, and Seville closed his eyes. And then he lowered it again. Seville cracked an eye open, and, seeing that the Grim Reaper had passed him over, let out a sob of relief. Well, well, said a gruff voice from the shadows. Looks like you're governed by flesh law after all, Lazarus. Bonchill had been watching from the alley mouth as the guardians were pounded to scrap. This had never really been a test of Lazarus's abilities, but more a test of his dependability. The construct's hatred of the guild was renowned, and there was probably nothing Lazarus would find harder to resist than killing a slippery weasel like Seville Septis. And von Schill needed to know if he was dependable. The decisive moment over, a dozen Freikorps troopers floated out of the shadows, and two trappers appeared on the roof. For a second I thought you were going to kill him, von Schill said as he walked over. For a second... Lazarus agreed. Why didn't you? The big construct retracted his bayonet and looked down at the sobbing lawyer with his expressionless eye. To protect Ampersand from guild attention would indicate fear of the guild, he said, grinding out each word in a monotone. We are not afraid. Let them come. The Freikorps leader made a gesture and the lawyer was hauled away. You did good tonight, Lazarus, he said. The Fry Corpse could use someone with your skills. I got something in the pipeline coming up, something big. Lazarus gazed down at him. State your purpose, he said in his bass metallic voice. Von Schill patted around himself until he found a cigar, jammed it in his mouth, and lit it. Oh. I think this will be right up your street. He grinned. That's it for another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure. <laughs>